Hello, good morning and welcome to Book Chat. Uh, my name's Philip. And I'm Jane. And we both work for Wiltshire Libraries and we're here this morning to talk about all things books. So we've got some news about new books that we've read, the odd Christmas title, um, some radio and TV programmes based on books and some things that you might want to get uh, up to over the Christmas holiday. Now there's lots of book ideas on our book chat groups. We've got these scattered around the county. Uh, Salisbury and Wilton has got one. Also Chippenham, Mountsham, Westbury, Warminster and Mere and Carn. And these book chat groups, all the members choose different books and review them. And they also have lots of funny odd things on there, uh, either bookshelves or different book sayings, things that will make you laugh. They're worth having a look at. At the moment, the Salisbury and Wilton book chat group has got a Christmas book advent calendar with a different Christmas title every day. So that's worth looking at. And they're on Facebook. I don't know whether you said that. They're on your individual library Facebook pages, aren't they? People want to Yeah, there's involved. a link that you can go from the, the yeah. main library Facebook page onto the book chat groups, but you need to, be able, you need to join the book chat mm. group to be part yeah. of it. So there's lots of those groups to explore if you want to find out more about books in more depth. But there's also other groups on Facebook, and one of the ones I found was called the UK Crime Book Club. If you're into crime, this is a great Facebook group. They have um, author interviews on there. They also have lots of discussions, people asking about uh, crime suggestions. So, for example, someone's asking about classic crime. They have discussions about favourite TV crime music, for example. Or they ask, uh, what do you think of particular authors? So John Conley was up for discussion with the Charlie Parker series. So there's a whole range of um, titles on there that people have mentioned and one of the recommendations was uh, Peter Everett, uh, Corrupt Bodies and the subtitle was Death and Dirty Dealing at the Morgue. So that sounds an interesting mm -hmm. crime book, doesn't it? And there was another one by Trish Harandetu and it, and it was called The Secret Santa. So a bit of a crime element on Father Christmas there. So there's lots of discussions in the um, crime UK Crime Book Club Facebook page. So I try that, but obviously only after you've had a look at the, the library Facebook pages and you get it <laughs> in the right order. <laughs> okay, so um, that's all the, the book chat group uh, pages to talk, tell you about. Um, I think Jane wants to tell us a little bit now about a little bit of horror and mystery. Yeah, well, this is actually a, a radio recommendation. Um, it's a drama series on Radio 4, and it's called The Shadow Over In Innsmouth, and it's the latest instalment in their Lovecraft investigation series, um, and these are based on the um, writings of H.P. Lovecraft. And the drama is presented in a podcast form with fictional presenters Kennedy Fisher and Matthew Hayward who investigate mysteries that are based on the horror novellas of H.P. Lovecraft. Now, you can listen to it as a standalone series, but actually to fully understand what's going on in the shadow of Inmouth and all the um, plots and things that are happening, you really need to listen to the first the previous two series. Now the first series is called The Strange Case of Charles Dexter Ward and the second series is called The Whisper in Darkness and I think they're both available on Radio 4 so you can work your way through all three um, series of the Lovecraft investigations. Um, the you, you kind of running through them all, although they're different stories um, each of the series running through them is this sort of complicated thread linking to the sort of worship of ancient creatures from another world and mysterious occult forces that work in the universe so that's sort of running through um through the series this particular um series the shadow over in innsmouth um the personal history of one of the of presenters kennedy fisher becomes increasingly entangled with the investigations and the mysteries that they're looking into. So if you like creepy supernatural stories with a, with some malign extra extraterrestrial forces thrown in, then it's this is a radio drama for you. Um, it's good, it's quite absorbing, 
the fo- the podcast format really works as you sort of feel you're there experiencing um everything that Kennedy Fisher and Matthew Hay would go through and the, and and in the series they record everything well they say they're recording everything that goes on everything that they look into every sort of frightening experience that they're involved in they've got their their tapes on so you really feel like you're experiencing it with them um so yes and it's, it's quite weird it is quite weird and strange the stories of hp lovecraft are quite weird and strange but it's a binge worthy series and it's a great distraction at the moment from uh, the grim reality around <laughs> us so i recommend that you can get really immersed in this strange sort of occult supernatural world you know, sucked in sounds great jane and um I think there's been TV adaptations as well. There have there? Oh, there's been lots of adaptations yeah. of H.P. Lovecraft stories, and the stories themselves are, are, are good to read. I mean, they have some, I think they have some sort of dodgy ideologies um, yeah, <laughs> in there as well. To, but the way they've modernised them really works, um, and the podcast format, because they are so creepy and strange, mm. the podcast format, where they're going through all this sort of weirdness and encountering these strange events and strange beings and sort of distorted or you get sort of distorted audio and all this sort of mm. stuff it, it, mm. it really works well so i do i do recommend that and it's radio four um, but it's it's you listen to it as a podcast type type thing okay yeah. and speaking of um, magical worlds um over christmas there's a program on wednesday at 7 30 p.m on bbc and it's the magical world of julia donaldson and this is an in-depth look at the author and her work and also the illustrator Axel Schaefer um, contributes to the programme. Uh, it features the books, obviously, The Gruffalo and Zog and the Flying Doctors and The Princess Mirabelle. As you can imagine, it's really mm. lovely. Pro- it sounds like a really lovely programme to watch, mm. and the BBC does tend to do these author summaries in programmes quite mm. quite well. She's a very interesting character anyway. She, she has an interesting life. Yeah, she is interesting. Yeah. And um, the readers include Helena Bonham Carter, and Amalda Staunton, so I think that might be worth looking at. And of course, the brilliance of Julia Donaldson, like lots of children's writers, is they, they although they write the story for the children, they also write for the parent as well. Mm. So the story is really good to read, and parents end up liking it, or the mm. adults end up liking Absolutely. it as much as the children. And that's a true skill of a children's writer. Something even also slightly magical that's come from the world of theatre is also one that Jane's going to tell us a little yeah, bit about. Yeah, this is. Um a production of Twelfth Night um, by the National Theatre that's showing on Sky Arts on Monday the 21st of December, so um, next, well, tomorrow actually, mm-hmm. tomorrow at 9pm, and it stars Tamsin Gregg, who's quite well known mm-hmm. for her various TV appearances, mm-hmm. um, probably recently most well known in um, Friday Night Dinner. But also, she was in The Archers for many years as Debbie, oh. and she still occasionally makes an appearance as Debbie in The Archers, yeah. so Talented there actress. we are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's something to look forward to. Um, there's also um, a programme about Quentin Blake. Here we are, there's wonderful illustrations. We all know there's illustrations now, and they're on cards and, and old doll books and all over the place. So um, the programme's called Quentin Blake's Clown, and this is on Christmas Day, at 7:40 p.m. it's on channel 4 so i should imagine that's worth watching not least because you'll be able to see all the illustrations as well as the um artist um doing them at the same time jane you've got something a bit more spooky well there i'm going to talk in a minute about um the ghost stories of mr james but also tying in with this is um a programme called The Haunting of Omar James. I don't know if that's a drama mm, on Radio 4, yeah. starring Mark Gatiss, who is a big sort of horror, mm. supernatural fan. He likes all of that sort of stuff. And that's on that's today? Today, yeah. At 3pm yeah. on Radio 4. So, so that's The Haunting of Omar James, starring Mike Gatiss. But I also wanted to just recommend the ghost stories of M.R. James. Now, I know the ghost stories of M.R. James are very famous and you may well have read them, but if you haven't, give them a go. It's a good time of year. It's sort of a ghostly, dark, midwinter time of year and it's a perfect sort of, um, the perfect season to try M.R. James's stories if you haven't before. 
uh, their their sort of wonderful macabre table tales. Wonderful macabre tales, perfect for this time of year. Now, M. R. James, his full name is Montague Rhodes James, was a Cambridge academic um, in the early nineteen hundreds, and he became very famous for his ghost stories. Now, many of his ghost stories were were originally written to be told aloud on Christmas Eve to, to entertain his friends. And obviously they were they were then, you know, they were then collected together and published. And he perfected a particular method of storytelling which has become known as Jamesian, the Jamesian way of, of telling stories, and it includes the following elements. A Jamesian tale includes these elements. A familiar setting in an English village, seaside town or country estate, or an ancient town in France Denmark or Sweden or an old and revered abbey or university so it tends to be one of those three settings. There's usually a nondescript and rather naive gentleman scholar as a protagonist and there's the, the discovery of an old book or other antiquarian object that somehow unlocks calls or calls down the wrath or at least attracts the unwelcome attention of a supernatural menace usually from beyond the grave. Dangerous to a librarian then, I was Absolutely, well, yeah, there is one that's set in a library mm -hmm. with a, <laughs> yes, a very spooky book. Yes, caught, yeah, that's the, um, I've forgotten what that's called, that's the Tractate Midas, which is set in a, in a university library. Um, in James's stories, you find unremarkable characters who unwittingly find themselves drawn into something dark and menacing. And the full horrifying details of what they're actually being drawn into, they're, they're often hinted at, but they're not always fully revealed. So your imagination does a lot of the work and probably, you know, you conjure up all these horrible things that he doesn't actually quite um, fully, fully tell you about. Um, and the characters find themselves dealing with these occult and malevolent forces, which, can, which they can barely believe exist but which they're forced to acknowledge through their own sort of fearful experiences. His, his stories sometimes have savage and violent acts at their heart, and these savage and violent acts tend to cause unquiet spirits to haunt the present and evil forces to operate within the normally comforting and ordinary world of his characters. So these sort of cosy worlds are upset by these, these sort of dark spirits. Um, unnatural acts of violence echo down the ages so something awful that happens in the past sort of has a ripple effect um, through the centuries and there are spirits in, in MR James's world there are spirits and forces on the edge of our existence that are, be that are really better off left alone and undisturbed people find often they sort of start just sort of giving them a little poke and then they sort of give them more of a poke and then they wish they really hadn't <laughs> and they'd left it all well alone if you if you enjoy a good story and you haven't tried M. R. James before, then definitely give um, his spine chilling tales a go. They're often short and scary, and they are perfect for dark nights, sitting by the fire and letting yourself imagine ghostly goings on and dark deeds from the comfort of your armchair. M. R. James tales you'll be able to borrow them from the library. Um, we, we, we will have I don't think actually we've got them they aren't I did have a look on RB digital and we haven't got them in audio book form or ebook form but you can certainly borrow them mm. there are there are copies of his collected um ghost stories uh, around the county and there is a great audio collection I mean we haven't got it but there is a great audio um collection of his stories that's narrated by Derek Jacobi particular favourites of mine are, are number 13 or room 13, Whistle and I'll Come to You My Lad and the Tractate Midas, they're all very good and I, I do recommend, I love and they're very good to listen to if you if they are on the radio, if you do see an M.R. James tale on, on the radio, listen to it because they're fantastic, they're, 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 they're kind of written to be listened to and read out loud. You won't, you won't forget them, Whistle and I'll Come to You, I can still picture my mind on the Suffolk beach very scary. <laughs> he does conjure up. He conjures up sort of very vivid pictures. Although I think you, you, you a lot of it comes from your imagination. It does. It's like uh, much, with so, yeah, very yeah. much so. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that might be perhaps a little too scary for you. Perhaps you want a little bit of something a little gentler. So one of the Christmas reads I've got a couple of Christmas reads that I'm looking forward to and I haven't read, so I thought I'd share them with you. So one of them is uh, Laurie Lee, Village 
Christmas and other notes of the English year. Lovely cover of them tobogganing down a snow laden lane. Of course, Laurie Lee is famous for Cider with Rosie, and this is beautiful writing um, of a lost England mm -hmm. in the winter time uh, in Slad, which is near Stroud, and in fact. Even then, he was writing about a countryside that was changing rapidly, uh, and even more so today, because they're still trying to find development in that area. Um, but um, I really like Laurie Lee, so I'm really looking forward to trying that. So, and also, it's short and to the point, so I think even I'll be able to get through this over the Christmas holidays. So I'm quite looking forward to Laurie Lee. And the other book that I treated myself to, and this is a bit off the wall, and Jane will probably say it's quite appropriate. But this book is called The Madman's Library. <laughs> you mm. see that it's got an amazing uh, cover and amazing when did you insets. Buy when did I buy it? Oh, I snuck it in the house yeah. a couple of weeks back. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, so it's, it's, it's called The Madman's Library The Strangest Books, Manuscripts, and Other Literary Curiosities from History by Edward Brooke Hitching. Now, this is beautifully illustrated, and if I give you a clue of, to some of the chapters, so there's books used in odd ways. So there's a, a hollowed out book used as a secret poison cabinet. There's a whole extract, of, there's a whole story about a toilet paper diary, which you can imagine some people who spend long enough, but no, this is serious. Someone's <laughs> in a prison and they've got a toilet paper diary. Um, there's books made of flesh and blood, chapter mm. on that. It's nice, isn't it? Mm. There's literary hoaxes, curious collections. Um, there's books of a spectacular size. And then there's books with a strange title. The book is beautifully illustrated. It's worth buying for the illustrations alone. It's not the cheapest book, but I'm already getting excited having just mm. looked at the pictures. So that's before I actually read the text. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm really looking forward to that. So that's The Madman's mm. Library by Edward Brook Hitching. I think we're going across the world now to oh the next gosh, book that yeah. Um, yeah. Jane wants to talk it's about. It's very different. <laughs> very different. <laughs> <laughs> yes, at the moment, I haven't finished it, but I'm reading Americano by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. Um, and I'm really enjoying it. Um, and I'm a bit wary, I'm a bit sort of worried about talking about it actually because it's quite a difficult book to describe. It's the first novel I've read by this author. Um, and as I said, I'm not, I'm, I'm probably not even halfway through it. It's a large novel with complex themes. Um, but it's also, a it's also a really good read. It's got, com it's compelling characters. It's got a love story at its centre. Um... The, 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 the characters um, the main character is called Ephemelu and she and her boyfriend Abimze meet at school in Nigeria where they fall madly in love they're both clever and ambitious but in, in quite different ways actually and but as they grow up they, they feel quite limited by the country that they live in the country of their birth and they see the West and particularly the US as a place of possible salvation where they might be able to achieve their ambitions um, and both characters end up leaving Nigeria at various uh, uh, in the book, and they leave Nigeria, and they also leave each other ultimately as well. If Amelu goes first, and she goes to America, um, Abinze later goes to the UK. But when they leave Nigeria, they come up against things that are quite um, strange to them, and and they have to deal with issues of race and class in ways that they never considered in Nigeria. Um, in the US, Ephemelu has to deal with other people's assumptions about her racial identity. And um, people assume that because she's a black African, she feels a natural affinity to African Americans, but actually their experiences and, and cultural heritage in, in some ways are very different. Um, and she becomes very much aware of sensitivities towards race that exist in America that she never really felt in Nigeria. People are very sensitive um, about race. There's white characters who overcompensate. Um, and then there's, there's sort of just racist attitudes that are sort of ingrained in society that, that um, she 
she experiences. But whilst she's studying and working in the US, Epimelu starts to write a successful blog and this blog is where she explores the immigrant experience and the, tangle issue, the tangled issues of race and identity in um, the US, her adopted country. I haven't actually got to the bit about Abinze moving to the UK, but I do know that again, instead of finding a place where he can thrive, um, he experiences a country where many people are quite hostile to immigrants and suspicious of their motives. And, I, and he's the first out of the pair to return to Nigeria and where and he does make his fortune in Nigeria, but it's not really in the idealistic way that he dreamed of when he was younger. And much of the novel is written as Ephemelu sits in a hair salon um, near to where she lives in America, getting her hair braided in preparation for her return to Nigeria. She makes the decision that she's going to go back. She feels the need to go back to Nigeria. And her mind wonders and she looks back on her childhood and her, her early adult in Nigeria and her move to America. And it takes in, as well as talking about her experiences in America, she also thinks about the place of women in Nigeria. Um, and obviously it's partly the reason why she goes, because it's very difficult for women um, to build, to, to sort of be independent, um, live an independent and educated life in such, you know, the society that she leaves in Nigeria is quite a deeply patriarchal society. Throughout the book, the hair of African women is a motif and it kind of underlines women's, women's limited existence in Nigeria, where ultimately they're controlled by men. And in the US, it, it, it's lots of many black women relax and straighten their, their natural colours, sorry, their natural curls in, a, in an attempt to make themselves less unruly and more acceptable in a society where white cultural values still predominate. Um, but as well as this sort of exploration of race and what it feels like to live, you know, the sort of um, disjointed feeling when you're an immigrant and um, having to adapt to a completely new culture and um, cultural viewpoint. There's also this love story and this this um, going on between Ephemelo and Abinze and even though even though they're away from each other and they sort of lose touch with each other they still do feel this strong pull towards each other and I'm assuming that when they are when Ephemelo returns to Nigeria they will reunite but whether it turns out happily for them i've still to discover but it is it's it's just a really big book and it's really difficult to, it is quite difficult to talk about because there's so much in there but it, it is quite an amazing yeah it's an amazing read and she mm. sort of holds a, a lot of complex ideas mm. together mm. it's mm. very impressive i think she was was she named as the author who was the sort of um Oh, the ultimate women's prize for fiction winner mm, of all mm, time. Mm, and she's a very yeah. good. The, the writing is is fantastic, mm. and the different perspectives and mm. the sort of clear eyed mm. sort of critique of American society mm. and the way class works and the way race is such a big part of how how that society works still in the present day. Great stuff. Thank you, Jane. Um, I've been reading an award winner as well. And I need to get it back to the library because there's a waiting list on it. <laughs> so the book is Shuggy Bane by Douglas Stewart. And this, as you um, may know, has won the Booker. And this is a debut novel. And this features um, Agnes Bane, who's got a, a little boy called Shuggy. And they live in Glasgow in the 1980s, just as the mining and the shipbuilding is coming to an end and the, the city goes into recession. They start off in a tower block and then her floundering husband disappears off and they get end up dumped in one of these um, out of town estates next to a mine. And Agnes has got lots of problems, not least alcohol. And Shuggy is known early on as being slightly different in, in inverted commas in, in one way or another. And um, he has to put up with a lot of bullying and tries to look after his mum. He's got an older brother who's also um, trying to sort her out and her daughter escapes as it were and goes off to Africa. Now this book is a debut novel and 
when you first read a summary, you think this is going to be grim, grim, grim. And it, That's what I, I thought. Am I <laughs> really going to miserable. like this? Um, and it is grim, and it, but it's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I mean, I, I, normally, you, uh, not normally, but often you read book of novels, you think, mm, not sure about that. Mm. But the last one I read, which was Barbara, is it Barbara Everisto? No, Bernadette, Bernadette, Bernadette Everisto, Everisto. Thank you. Yeah. Girl, Girl, that was brilliant. That was brilliant. And this is fantastic. Yeah. And it just puts you in the place of this estate in the 1980s. There's lots of scenes where they, they go, they're trying to get scrap metal in the slag heaps and they get discovered by uh, a security guard. There's wonderful scenes in taxis going through the rain hammering, the streets that have you know, got rain hammering down in Glasgow. The, the effect on people of drink and alcohol and how people get from one benefit to the next but by using it all on drink and how they crack open the meters to get there but you can tell this person knows what he's talking about and that's because a lot of it is you know partially autobiographical yeah, it's it, yeah. um, but it's so it's a brilliant book mm -hmm. and i thoroughly recommend it so this is shuggy bane by douglas stewart there's a there's a waiting list but it's worth waiting for really really mm. good really good book uh, just to finish up, I also wanted to tell you about some online activities that are going on. This is with the WEA that used to be known as the Workers' Education Association, but it's just called the WEA these days. And on Christmas Day itself, they've got some free online activities. And this is for people who, uh, if perhaps if you're on your own and you want to interact with other people, or perhaps if you've Perhaps you just want to take a break from the people you're with. Who knows? Could that ever happen on Christmas Day? Well, Surely not. Get away from some of your family. Surely not. But, um, so they've got things like, they've got a Christmas virtual walk in Dorset and Sussex. They've got Christmas carols. They've got Christmas games. This is all on Zoom. It's all free. They've got Christmas cooking through the ages. They've also got a uh, Queen's speech interval and discussion about that. And they've got festive crafts, and this is all free on Christmas Day. So that, that might be worth looking at. And the WEA website is worth looking at anyway, because there's lots of low-cost lectures that you can listen to. There's one about Christmas in medieval times, and they're quite low-cost to join. So it's a really interesting website I, I discovered, and I thought it was really, really good to look at. So there's that. And finally, just to let you know what Wiltshire Libraries is offering over the Christmas period. So we have got Christmas story times every evening on our Facebook pages. Uh, a lot of the children's team are doing some beautiful stories, most of them with the Christmas theme, and they are on our Facebook page or YouTube, and you can watch them um, at any time. And the wonderful Susie from Amesbury Library, she's been doing some fantastic activities, Christmas activities, and she's been making reindeer lollipops and marshmallow snowmen. And they're fantastic. They're really good. I mean, if I made these, it'd just be a just be a mess in the corner, basically. That's what it would be. It wouldn't be anything, you know. That's right, isn't it, Jane? It'd just yeah, be, it would you know, be much better if I made them. So. But she does a brilliant job. Yeah. Um, and these activities and these story times are all on our Facebook pages and also on our YouTube Can I just channels. mention that you do, you've do? you been doing some um, tea and chat sessions in oh, December yeah. as well, on Tuesday afternoons, I think every fortnight. Mm. Um, at 3 p.m. Yes. I think it was the 1st of December, the 15th, and the 20. There's one this Tuesday second. with Basil. Yes. yes, and these yeah. yeah these are poems chosen by our volunteers. This time, yeah, I mean you all you tea yeah. and chat. You always have um, prose yeah. and poetry recommendations, but for these three in December, we've we've sort of been we asked our volunteers mm -hmm. um at, in our libraries across the county really to cut to to recommend some of their favourite poet poetry and prose. And they've come up with some really good um, suggestions. And it's also a way of saying thank you to them mm. and thank you to our volunteers for all their yeah. ongoing support and patience through this year where many of them haven't been able to volunteer as normal in the library, mm. but they're still being very supportive from mm. afar. Yeah. So it's really to say we haven't forgotten them and we're no, very no. appreciative of them. We're very grateful. And we're very yeah. grateful to um, everyone who's been uh, liking us and supporting us on our Facebook yeah channels and our youtube channels it really does appreciate that the effort we put in is is appreciated and we do like the fact that 
although it's been a really difficult year and we haven't been able to interact in libraries as we might wish, mm. one thing that we have learned as a, li a library service a lot more, all of us, is how to uh, or tr have learned a lot more about giving our services in other ways than mm. using ebooks and e audio. So, uh, tiny good things come out. We have had to develop new skills very quickly, skills. but that's not necessarily a bad thing yeah, in the long not, term. Yeah. We've still got some yeah. learning to go, as you're experiencing yeah. now. But there <laughs> we are. <laughs> it's a big well. learning process, yeah. <laughs> So um, on that uh, note, <laughs> um, all that remains for me to say is, um, I think, to wish you a happy Christmas. And we hope to see you in our libraries next year and eventually later on in the year, next year, back to some sort of yeah. normality. So yeah. I think we just wish you um, yeah, uh, a happy Christmas, Christmas and a happy New Year. Yeah. Bye merry for Christmas. now. Goodbye. Thanks for joining us. Bye. Bye.